Welcome to Gems from the Wisdom Traditions, well, a conversation circle. My name is David Sanders. I'm fortunate to be the host today and would like to invite the director of Still and Moving Center, our guest speaker for today, speaking on the topic of right mindfulness. And as a bit of an introduction, I'd like to mention just a little something that you may or may not know about Renee's uh, background. So more than 40 years ago, she encountered an ancient uh, Tibetan Buddhist text about the Bodhisattva path of, of uh, compassion. It was translated by Helena uh, Blavatsky into a little book called The Voice of the Silence. Renee has been profoundly grateful for his teaching ever since then. She more recently became acquainted with the teaching of Tibetan Buddhist nun named Pema Chodron and was attracted to that same spirit of compassion. I'd like to turn it over to Renee. Renee, welcome. Thank you so much, David. I uh, really am so appreciative of everyone being here today for this really significant topic. I think in our everyday lives and as we relate to the larger world. I want to share with you a little incident from last night that I think, um, points to something about Pema Chodron's teaching. I was getting a little uh, pre-speaker jitters Maybe the rest of you have never had that, but I was getting them and <laughs> saying to uh, Cliff, oh, Cliff, you know, I haven't read all of her books and uh, I really don't know if I've studied enough about her to be able to be a presenter and just going into this little drama. And he just said, you know, calm down. It's, it's fine. <laughs> You'll do great. Why don't you just tell a little bit of her biography and uh, mention what she means to you. Well, in preparing for you, I didn't even get to her biography. I don't know very much about this woman at all. <laughs> she just had me at compassion. <laughs> as soon as I started to hear about Pema Chodron and started reading a few of her words and the, the gentleness that she advocates in the way that we deal with everyone in our lives, as well as with ourselves, something to me just uh, resonated with that kind of um, compassion that is in the Kuan Yin pledge. Never will I seek nor receive private individual salvation. Never will I enter into final peace alone, but forever and everywhere Will I live and strive for the redemption of every creature from the bonds of conditioned existence? So that kind of dedication to the uplift of the universe is behind the Bodhisattva path, behind that Kuan Yin pledge of compassion. And it's what I feel whenever I read some of Pema Chodron's work. She's an, originally an American. She has evidently several children and grandchildren. So she must, I imagine, have been married at some point. And she eventually became a Tibetan Buddhist nun. And she has been teaching from that standpoint, standpoint for many decades. When she speaks to us, and you can sometimes even hear her um, live online these days. I was fortunate to go to one of her seminars um, earlier this year. She just speaks from the st straight from the heart and just common sense. And she does it from this very mindful perspective. In considering this idea of mindfulness, I'm reminded of a quote by Ralph Waldo Emerson, who we recognized a couple weeks ago when Maurice Bischoff spoke on Emerson. And that quote is, I am the I by which the universe beholds itself and knows itself divine. And so this this idea of us as pure awareness 
of seeing beings that eventually we'll be able to see everywhere in the whole universe is behind, I believe, this, this Buddhist concept of mindfulness. That we can be so impartial, it's as if we are this giant eye that can see the whole universe passing by. And meanwhile, we can focus in a little bit more uh, particularly in watching our own lives passing by, watching ourselves move around in the world, uh, watching ourselves as if we're looking into our own minds and hearts and we're seeing all these fluttering thoughts and emotions scattering through like the different fish in an aquarium perhaps. And we can just do that with great impartiality. We can just withdraw any sense of personal attachment and concern and worry and fear and guilt and <laughs> all of those things that um, the Buddha would call afflictive emotions that don't do us any good at all, don't help our lives and don't help us be of service to anybody else in the world. And so many times when Pema Chodron is speaking, she uses these phrases like softening the edges of our gaze of um, as we would want to be viewing someone else with compassion, as we would want someone else to view us with compassion, let's look at our own thoughts and emotions with that same gentleness and compassion and just give ourselves a break and allow, um, allow ourselves to naturally focus on something higher. In the uh, quotations that uh, you received perhaps a few minutes before the seminar started, we read a, in one and the same piece about compassion and about being a warrior. She speaks of being a warrior. Well, how is that being compassionate? It kind of sounds contradictory. And I think it's because of that tremendous fearlessness that a warrior embodies. And certainly for us to look upon everything that goes on in our lives and goes on in the world around us with compassion requires the fearlessness of a warrior. There's so much that's scary. And so, to not grab on to those fears of ours, not to get stuck in those fears, just acknowledging sometimes I feel scared, I feel nervous, I don't know, is something that Pema really recommends. In fact, so many times we think of ourselves as needing to be grounded and while that has its truth, Pema also speaks about us feeling comfortable in the ground less. Nothing in this world stays the same. And we know this from science and the Buddha talked about it 2,500 years ago. Everything is changing. And this tends to be pretty scary for us we like to feel comfortable. We like to feel like we know what's going on. We know what's uh, going to happen next. Like we can identify things and put things into categories and boxes and hold on to them. And in fact, what Pema and Buddhists in general seem to be saying is that that actually is a, a cause of suffering for us. We cannot grasp onto anything and keep it from changing. It's just going to change 
we can't even hold it in our hands because it will it will disintegrate and turn into something else. And so lightening our grip, which is called tanha or grasping um, in the Buddhist philosophy, lightening our grip, letting go, letting be, and existing in this state of the unknown, this groundlessness, not always feeling like we have to hold on really tightly when in fact we could float. And uh, there's that idea of sometimes we feel like we're holding up something so heavy. And if we just realized that we were in the, the waters of the ocean, uh, the waters of the universe, the waters of compassion, things would just float on their own and we don't have to keep trying to hold them up so much and hold on to them so hard. And so this mindfulness that she's talking about is this clear sightedness and when something comes into our view that makes us feel afraid, um, the book from which I have taken the video is entitled, When Things Fall Apart, Heart Advice for Difficult Times. Um, and it's, it was written several decades ago and it seems absolutely as relevant now and perhaps more so than it was then. So as we approach something that seems difficult to us, that seems scary to us, that makes us anxious, she just coaches us to calmly stay there, rest with it, not to turn and flee, not to try to wipe it out, just rest with what it is that we're afraid of. Just be with it. And that's the mindfulness practice. Just be with it. And pretty soon we'll be able to see through it more. We'll be able to see that, oh, well, yeah, I guess that wasn't so bad. And pretty soon also we'll just start to see it breaking up. And the reason that this conduces so well to um, compassion is, is twofold. One, it allows us to look at other people who may in some way cause us dis-ease, cause us to feel threatened, cause us to feel not as smart or, you know, whatever it is, some, in some way, we don't feel comfortable around that other person. It's usually because in my experience of how we feel about ourselves being around that other person. And so if we are able to achieve that, that feeling of letting go, looking carefully, allowing ourselves to truly listen to what that other person has to say, let that flow in without kicking up a whole bunch of resistance on our part, just the same way we're going to watch carefully our thoughts and the feelings as they're rolling in and out, take in what this person has to say, soften the ed edges of our response to it, then we can be better able to give a very measured and compassionate response to what it is that we hear, what it is that we see. She also recommends that when we look at someone else, we visualize this person. Let's say they're not in the room with us and we have some anxiety about them for some reason. We look at this person's face, we visualize it, and we may even say the person's name, if that helps, and we give this person a blessing. May this person who irritates me be free of suffering and the roots of suffering. 
And as we give the person this kind of blessing, our, our fear itself begins to dissolve. We can just watch it fade away. Another thing that she encourages us to do with our mindfulness practice is to watch when we start putting up walls and fences against other people. Oh, I don't like what they're saying. Oh, they're different. Oh, you know, we, <laughs> we create all these, these walls. I don't really have to pay attention to them because they da 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 fill in the blanks. Um, and that she says is another one of those forms of fear. So be the warrior, keep those walls down. <laughs> Perhaps that's one of um, those teachings that we hear a lot these days of remaining vulnerable ourselves. And, and just allow ourselves to be in that, that state of nobody's right, nobody's wrong. We're here together in this. She uses the word patience a lot. And when we are truly finding ourselves mindless, mindful, it's a, a state that is of presence in the here and now. Nothing else is going on. We're here and now. There actually may be a lot of other things going around us and we can track those as some, like just the same way we can tra track these different thoughts and emotions. And yet our main attention is in the here and now. And so really there's nothing but patience if we're in the here and now. <laughs> we're not uh, pining after the past and we're not running after the future. Uh, we're having extreme patience. And, Perhaps that is how uh, we can understand that. one of my favorite quotes of hers. Um, I guess maybe the first, the first one that I grabbed onto, so to speak, <laughs> as a little bit of a, a life raft was, um, nothing ever goes away until it has taught us what we need to know. Nothing ever goes away until it has taught us what we need to know. Yeah. So we allow ourselves to take in whatever it is that is going on in our lives at this time, are going on in the nation at this time, are going on in the world at this time, whatever it is, and just know that until we learn what we need to learn from it, we're still going to be dealing with it. <laughs> and perhaps the, the more we accept that, the more readily accept that, the more easily it actually can um, dissipate and go away so that we make room for whatever the next thing is on our horizon of learning. So those are a, uh, a few thoughts on some of the teachings of mindfulness, which is the seventh of the Eightfold Path in Buddhism uh, to leading a life um, that will be more free of suffering and will conduce to our alleviating the suffering of others. Thank you very much, Renee. Beautiful presentation. I'm wondering um, if, if I could just engage with you for just a moment longer. A couple, a couple of things came to mind. Is there, a, is there something particular in your personal experience of things that... Um, perhaps cause you to come ungrounded, come unglued? What, what things for you facilitate that falling apart? We'll talk about how you get it back together in a moment, but for you personally, is there something in particular that helps you to fall apart? You're not thinking of me, are you, David? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> I wouldn't dare. <laughs> um... I, I really like to uh, 
think that I'm good at doing things. Uh, I, I think I have a perfectionist tendency and mm -hmm. when I feel like I'm being really far from being perfect, that, that bothers me. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, then the other question, the follow on for that would be, you know, what, what helps you to reground? What, what helps you pull back together? What sort of activities in on a practical level uh, bring you back to center? I think this, this, um, this coaching of, of the kind that Pema Chodron gives that, um, you know, I always want to treat other people um, mm. with patience and with compassion. Not that I always succeed, but I certainly would always want to do that. And so I need to accord that to myself as well. And, mm -hmm. you know, horse whipping myself is just not going to do anybody any good. Mm -hmm. um, I always do the best I can. Um, mm -hmm. So trust in that and, and move on. <laughs> Now, I know I'm uh, getting to know a little more about you uh, with each session, but I, I only recently learned that you were a gymnast earlier on, and I know you've been a lifetime dancer. I'm curious about any uh, physical activities that you use on a practical level to bring you back to center. Many here may know that I do a practice called Nia. It um, combines dance, martial arts, and several healing arts, including yoga and Feldenkrais. And it's done barefoot to music, and it's very joyful. Mm. It's a mindful movement practice. And mm. when I say that, I mean that we are asked to really be present in the physical body, to be uh, aware of what our body sensations are. We're not asked to be trancing out, floating away. Uh, we're also not encouraged to just be following the leader, doing the, the move the way the leader does, which tends to make one check out and take uh, and lose responsibility for keeping our own body safe, for example. Mm -hmm. So uh, I find it uh, really, really helpful to move mindfully. It, uh, it really has a tendency to zap out a lot of these afflictive emotions. I just don't have room for it in my consciousness. I'm so <laughs> present, present on the dance floor and uh, just having such a wonderful time, anything that was bugging me <laughs> has floated away <laughs> by about two minutes after the start of class. Uh, so I would say that that's helpful. And it also um, had helped me I, to learn that by my being aware of inhabiting a physical body, um, which by the way, there's a Buddhist Vipassana practice, uh, which I haven't done. It's a silent practice that people do for like 10 days at a time. And I believe it's a, you start with um, awareness of body sensation. Um, my experience is that uh, at least from the standpoint of doing Nia, the more I became aware and really very aware of inhabiting the body, the more I realized I was not a, that body at all. And so it, it further kind of evokes the question, well, who is it? What is it that's living inside this body, right? And then that just leads to, well, it must be the same who or what, that's feeling all these emotions. And it must be the same who or what that is having all these thoughts. And then that becomes a really good question. <laughs> okay, who is it? What is it? And I, I think that whoever or whatever it is, is that which is being mindful. That's watching the observer, the witness, the spectator, the eye or the eye, <laughs> which is the eye that I am curious as to 
whether anyone else would like to share experiences that they have of uh, watching themselves, being mindful of themselves, and then doing some self-coaching as a, as a really good coach. One of those encouraging, <laughs> enthusiastic, positive coaches. Has anyone else had experiences like that? Who would like to jump in? I can say I've definitely had many experiences and I love the, the mention of, and I think I learned this when I was about 21 or so, I heard of Pima Tra Children and I had been feeling stressed and living in New York and, and I heard of what you had said that imagine this person who is what we call bringing tension. Of course, they're not the one bringing it, but it's causing me to have some reaction and visualize that person and sit with them and wish them blessings. And, and I always practice that now in the moments that something comes up with somebody, I hold them in my thoughts and I do a prayer. And whenever there's a difficulty in doing the prayer, I actually feel like this is good. Like, okay, now push through that difficulty feels really good. And it's kind of interesting. And it very, usually very quickly will shift. And all of a sudden there's just this love for the person. And so that's been a really strong tool that I've used throughout, through many years now. And it's effective, I think it's really, and it feels freeing. It feels like, oh, I'm, I'm not holding on to these weights of needing to be reactive and needing to hold a grudge or hold anything. That's just like putting rocks on top of myself. It doesn't really help anybody, it doesn't help myself. So that I love hearing that, and I think that's such a a practice to to spread and to to use. Well, while we're waiting for someone to be brilliant, I could uh, just mention a correlative to what Sarah just mentioned and Renee brought up. But someone one time, it was really helpful to me um, when I was having a difficulty, said, just said, why don't you try to be more curious? <laughs> and in relationship to people, and it, I think it's something that really does, it helped me to kind of break these walls or barriers or um, stresses that come from, um, immediately forming judgments or, or uh, impressions. I would think of it and I'd have a different relationship to that person that was very freeing and much more um, interesting and, and um, compassionate. Yes, I, and I, I do think uh, Pema Chodron uses that idea of curiosity. Um, it, it's one of those things that frees the mind rather than narrowing it. It frees it to have more um, flexibility of perspective. And she also uses um, the word uh, humor um, and to, to find the humor in things. And that also seems to um, help prevent that hardening of judgment that we tend to do and and we could even be judgmental about ourselves for doing it however i think that when we're forming those judgments probably what's happening is that we're somehow th feeling threatened and we somehow feel like we have to contain or confine something by giving it a definition by putting judgment upon it and so it's once again, that softening. <sighs> I'm not afraid. <laughs> um, I, maybe there's even something a little bit funny about the person and, um, and I, can, I can be curious. 
gosh, maybe there's something I, I never thought about them or so, something I knew about them that I don't know. I wonder what that could be. I wonder what it could be like to look at things from that person's perspective. And we, and it, it awakens this kind of creative imagination, not that curiosity. Oh, well, imagine. Uh, Donna, I think I, it's from you probably that I heard about walking a mile in another man's moccasin. Um, mm. yeah, what would it be like to walk in? I think you could apply it to, um, you know, ideas as well. Doesn't not wouldn't have to be just related to a person or a personal wall in that way, but something that you don't understand. And so you tend to go, maybe just even fall into habits and patterns from the past that fill in the void. And things like humor, curiosity, I would think that those are mindful uh, practices in, in an unusual way, maybe, um, that draw your mind to focus on something that's positive uh, and to fill a void that otherwise is going to be filled, <laughs> you know, without your consent, maybe. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. I, I was actually wondering if, if fears, if our fears are a form of bondage, if we could use curiosity toward our fears to help dissolve our fears. I actually um, met Renee from the NIA class and that how I got introduced to her. And if any of you have ever been in the class, I mean, it's an experience that everybody should try. And she's gotten women that very conservative and very like, you know, to do movements that I think that they would have done. And sometimes to go beyond what she instructs. And so it's very, um, uh, and you know, lightning or to release. It's like a really release for all the women that do come for it and enjoy it. I haven't done it of late that much because I only do it with her at the Y. But, and I do more yoga and with yoga, because I do it, it's a practice that I do almost always um, a lot. So in yoga at the end of the session, I always feel very, um, my body feels great. And it's like Renee's Nia too. You feel like you let go of a lot. And so at the end when we're thanking or um, she's thanking us. And so I always bow down and I ask for guidance, strength, energy and protection for whoever would like to receive it and um, to take it in. And because I have received so much from the session itself from doing it um, that I would like anybody who'd like to receive it that they do. So while they're doing the namaste, I would say that. But if you have never done Nia, I think we should do a session virtually. <laughs> um, it, it's surprising how people have learned to let go. And um, even if I don't go all the time, how they stretched out to different limits. Um, and you talk about freedom or being able to, you know, go beyond what's within the box. And I think many women have, because even if I don't attend all the time, I think you've uh, created that atmosphere with the group that does. So maybe one day you do it virtually with all of us. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sharon. I, yes, I, I do teach it three times a week online for Still and Moving Center. So um, I so welcome any and all of you. And it was founded by um, Carlos Rosas and Debbie Rosas. So it is for women and men both. So men don't feel shy. Um, and it's just one of those practices that um, can, since it's unfamiliar, uh, raise up a little anxiety. And um, so I was very proud of my husband, Cliff, when, um, oh, about 15 years after I'd been starting it, maybe 18 years after I'd been doing Nia, he one time overcame his fears <laughs> of doing this practice and, and joined us on the Still and Moving Center dance floor when there was a great big group, group, group of people all dancing Nia together. 
and he felt like he wouldn't be seen. <laughs> whether that, <laughs> whether that uh, was a matter of curiosity, I don't know, maybe. Like, I wonder what that feels like. <laughs> what this lady has been doing for so many years. I wonder what that actually feels like. Um, I wonder what other people think about this idea of, of curiosity helping to uh, somehow break through our bondage to fears. Well, I think if you're not curious, then you've already formed some idea of how things are. And that certainly locks you into rails, and which is pretty much the opposite of being mindful. So I think curiosity is a precursor to being mindful. You're like, okay, uh, I'm here, I'm present, what's going on? Uh, and it's that, it's that coming, coming at it from a place of questioning. Uh, as um, one of my recent teachers who's uh, combined mindfulness with NVC and somatics, uh, Oren Sofer, in a book called Say What You Mean, he first step is presence. The second step is to approach whatever's happening from curiosity and from care, sort of setting aside your agenda. So now there's an opening, there's what's really happening as opposed to what we might be thinking. Mm. It seems with fear, there's this overall, and any kind of suffering, there's that overall need of control that this life that is fleeting these all these states that are constantly changing that truly we can't and we're not meant to control that something in our mind gets stuck the ego gets stuck on needing to control and so curiosity is this beautiful little door to open that says let's just explore and it's kind of the opposite of control but it can be a a subtle and a trick kind of a trick to get that controlling mind to just deter the attention over to something a lot more fun and curiosity mm. is a lot of fun. I, I know I've experienced that. I really dislike flying in planes and there's this fear that comes up, but I really enjoy traveling. So I actually just came off a flight yesterday and always it invokes this sense of anxiety and this loss of control that I'm up in the air it just feels so unnatural sitting on this seat in the air. But I've used that looking down on myself, all these different tools, kind of being a coach to myself. And one of the best tools is to treat it like a carnival ride and to be curious about where the next movement is going to go. And I trick my mind into finding it fun. And the more the turbulence, the more fun it is because I'm on this ride and it's just moving around. <laughs> and so that actually has, it works in a funny way. It works a lot of the time to at least de-escalate the sense of what's happening. <laughs> it can be very effective. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Malia. David, I think uh, Sandhya was going to say something a minute ago. Okay. If she's still there. Hi, sorry, I, um, there she is. I'm in the middle of uh, making food right now, so my hands are covered in chocolate and coconut. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I just wanted to share on those thoughts about um, about fear and curiosity. I'm reading uh, The Surrender Experiment by Michael Singer right now, who some of you may be uh, familiar with, and I would highly recommend it. Um, but he uh, likes to remain curious about those times where he's challenged because it's an opportunity like Sarah was sharing to, um, to challenge the ego and to um, incrementally break free of the ego a little bit at a time. To look at those moments and be like, wow, the ego is really coming up for me right now. Let me sit with this because it's an opportunity to let go even a little bit more. Mm. Yeah, very similar, I think, to what the great example that share, uh, Sarah was just sharing. Sounds as if you're equating um, fear to holding on and somehow surrendering and letting go to helping to dissipate that fear. Yeah. I think Malia was looking for a, a spot 
on the maybe i just i love all this talk about curiosity and it just reminded me of something that i use to help <clears throat> reframe myself and it's just becoming aware of times where i'm experiencing awe you know and awe is um a, an experience where you are maybe trying to understand something but you can't like how small a baby's toes are or how big the grand canyon is you know there's this sense of of grasping for understanding but knowing that you won't be able to really get there that i think is really important and i think it serves a similar function to curiosity and just expanding that sense of awareness and at least for me um, <clears throat> it's a, an important feeling that just helps to kind of gently put me in my place you know just to 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 understand that i'm just one part of a whole working beautiful universe and somehow that that makes me feel better especially if it's in like a natural inspiring place thank you for me curiosity has to do with no no expectation also if i'm in the moment with an open heart and um, and have no expectation and open for what it's coming and i'll also kind of yeah open-minded to see something new that's curiosity main thing no ha having no expectation for me so that's then I'm I'm in that space I think <laughs> on on alert I mean I cannot sleep <laughs> and willing to see some new things or or whatever comes curious what's coming next. Hmm. <laughs> that that's interesting to me because um, in the Native American tradition they have this idea of the trickster. Um, maybe. In the medieval ages, it was the the um, what do you call him the the Joker for the king? What um, jester? The what? The jester. The jester, right? That his job was to um, interrupt uh, things that were going on and turn the king in a different direction, turn him away from things that uh, he, he didn't need to focus on in, in to things that he did need to focus on. In the Native American tradition, it, it, it's kind of elusive to me, but it, ha it has to do with, um, you meant the previous speaker just mentioned the idea of the, um, the expectations and it, it seems like it's, the ability to trick the mind, to trick the mind that's stuck by doing something unexpected. And then you're free, you just, you can see a little light <laughs> and then you can move on from there. So that's the job of the, and a shaman is always a trickster. Someone that can teach you how to get out of yourself, so to speak. That's a, a function of that character in Indian tradition, in uh, American Indian traditions, and other mm -hmm. indigenous traditions too. So, thank you. That was helpful. I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> uh, I'm uh, curious to tie this back. I'm I'm in a sort of a philosophy 101 class at UH right now, and we just last week we were talking about the eightfold path, the four noble truths, four noble truths, eightfold path being the sort of the prescription for uh, how to how to how to lead a uh, proper life. They divided the eight paths up into three divisions, and right mindfulness, as Renee mentioned, is the seventh. And in my notes, it says, uh, right mindfulness means to meditate on the four sadipadas, body, feelings, mind, and mental structures. And I'm, I'm curious to draw that in to um, see if it stimulates any further thoughts on this top topic of right mindfulness. And that word right, of course, meaning more appropriate as opposed to correct. 
Well, I, I think uh, there are going to be many people with a, a lot clearer grasp philosophically on your question, David. And my simple um, approach at the answer would be, in a way, we have three realms that these, uh, that whatever it is that's being mindful, whoever it is, that self of ours, or however we want to call that, has uh, the, the physical realm to be aware of, has our emotional realm to be aware of with all of our desires and um, our fears and our joys and our loves, and then our mental um, realm. So those all seem to have been mentioned in the quote that you gave us. Um, mm -hmm. And then you gave a fourth that I mental would, structures. mental structures. Yeah, mind and mental structures. Hmm. Maybe those are more like the belief systems, more like the pattern, uh, pattern thoughts of the mind as opposed to the more um, ephemeral moment by moment uh, mental activities. Yeah. Yeah, perhaps I, I suspect you're right there more of the uh, lower mind and higher mind great sandra it looks to me as if you have something to share with us <laughs> I, um i was um curious had not read much about her so i did a quick google search and um i found a great website and uh it was kind of they had a free pdf that's kind of like an overview study guide of her books and so I can post that if people are interested in that. But, um, you know, I've just been interested just these days of just in trying to process everything that's happening with the negativity and, and trying to step back from just being outraged at some of the things I see to, to being curious about how, how, you know, someone could be thinking or doing or, you know, that type of thing. And so just looking at different philosophers, I've had, um, just recently got a couple of books that were about Bruce Lee and that whole concept of be like water. And so I'm reading his um, biography and that book because it really is about, you know, the, um, um, and just that whole concept of being like water, you know, how water describes this feeling of just being angry and you know trying to punch the water and how water takes on the shape of whatever it is and water penetrates everything and so anyway so that's kind of um been helpful you know just to read you know other uh, how other people have dealt with you know the world you know but their own uh emotions and feelings about the world and processing that and um, so anyway so it, so it is helpful but I was um, very uh, impressed with you know some of the quotes and I would love to have some of the books I think I just had a very surface level of who she was and so this little study guide which I just was kind of going through this afternoon was was really um, helpful it's very you know kind of um, distills down some of uh, her concepts in books and some of her more uh, yeah. quotes. I have a, a question. Um, with this concept of mindfulness, I wonder if those of you who have really uh, thought about the Eightfold Path a lot could talk about the link between mindfulness and then meditation. And I, as we go into the um, eighth path, that will have to do directly with meditation. My understanding that mindfulness as a precursor would be that ability to really carefully watch and monitor our thoughts. Um, also an ability to sift out that which is not useful and let it go. Um, whereas meditation is going to be more of a matter of, of directing our thoughts and tr truly excluding out others in order to really pay great, great attention to our chosen um, object of meditation. So I'm curious about those of you who've really thought about this Eightfold Path 
and this distinction between the seventh and the eighth, the, the mindfulness and the meditation itself. One way to think about it um, is in relation to uh, teaching that you hear the Dalai Lama give uh, quite a lot as um, <clears throat> ultimately mindfulness be, um, would be for the, for the Buddhist seeker would be mindfulness of the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha um, as uh, like ever-present realities. Um, and in the, the Vajrayana and the Mahayana tradition, you get this really magnificent idea that everything, in fact, is the Buddha nature. If we saw it clearly, uh, if, we, if we had the, the eyes, the clarity of vision and of hearing um, and of inward uh, awareness, we would know not only are we the Buddha, <laughs> but everything is the Buddha nature. Um, and in fact, the, the whole process of the Vajrayana tradition is spoken of as being a process of purification where you are slowly eliminating all those blocks which prevent one from seeing and knowing that as, as the truth. Um, and you could think of, um, so the, the various stages of mindfulness, which Pema Trojan, you know, is very useful in, in, especially for those of us who, like most of us are caught in various stages of afflictive emotion and slowly trying to uh, parse our way through that to settle the, the, that lower turbulent mind, to step away from it and to see things from a, a different perspective. Um, and then when you talk about meditation, um, there's various ways and various practices, of, of course, in the Buddhist tradition, there's an enormous um, you know, body of teaching that discusses meditation. So it's not as though you can talk about it as being one thing, one thing only. Uh, in fact, you could say it's threefold, what they call dharana, uh, dhyana and samadhi. Samadhi being that highest state of meditation where um, you're, is a complete absorption in the one, you could say. But dharana being the, the focus of the mind on one particular interior object. Part of the way that the Dalai Lama also speaks about the practice of um, links meditation with this idea of the dharma. And I think uh, David was sort of suggesting this, is that you, you undertake a process of analysis. So it, it starts with a discursive mind, analyzing and looking at either a situation or a person or a thing. And um, understanding, trying to understand the collection of causes and conditions which, which brought that about. And, you know, there's a famous example of a cart. You know, we think of a, um, of a car or a cart uh, as being a thing. But if you start to analyze the cart, you realize, oh, well, there's the wheels, there's the spokes, there's the, uh, there's the steering wheel. And then you can take the, the spokes apart. You can take the axle apart. You can take the various parts apart and you realize, oh, well, where's the cart now? Um, it, it's the combination of a whole series of things. And then who built the wheel? And how, what is it made of? And where did that come from? And as you start to analyze anything in this way, you realize that there's an endless series <laughs> of causes and conditions which brought about that thing to appear to you that it appears, but that it has in itself no, no self nature. But anyway, so you have, on the one hand, you have this kind of analysis. You can apply that to persons and to situations as well. And part of the reasons we're so caught up in afflictive emotions, the Dalai Lama says, is because we reify, we, I, we, we solidify or identify a particular person or ourselves as being some one thing um, when, when we're not, and we're not understanding the karma the long chain of karma which brought that about um, to be to appear to us in the way that it's appearing. But, so to kind of summarize all this, in the end he says that that process of analysis, if we apply it uh, regularly, daily, and to many different things, what we come to understand in that process 
is the ultimate nature of that thing is the Buddha nature. <laughs> that, that uh, which you can, in, in the Buddhist tradition, you know, it's also spoken of as the void because it's, it's, um, it's so universal. It's not something that you can put in a box and say it's one thing, right? It's, it's um, without bounds, it's a boundlessness. Um, and so in that sense, this, this, uh, this meditation upon everything being the Buddha nature or what's called shunyata, starts as a discursive analysis of situations or persons, ends up coming together in being one thing. And that's the understanding of the Buddha nature. And so, so that when one experiences any situation, one, it, that because of the analysis, even one, though one is using the discursive mind, one is realizing that that is the Buddha nature being represented to oneself. And so even in waking consciousness, one doesn't have to isolate oneself in a room to be meditating on the Buddha, but one can be present in any situation and have that conviction that, that everything is indeed the Buddha nature. Thinking of what Sandra said about the water, and so immediately came to my thought, because one of my favorite books is Siddhartha by Herman Hesse, and how he had searched on and on everywhere. He was a aesthetic, he was a rich man and everything. And then he came to, Hi, to the end and he came to a period where he didn't know, um, you know, what to do. And he was seven, trying to cross and there was a, a boatman that was taking him over the river. And, uh, and he, and the boatman says, the answer is in the river. So he sat there contemplating and thinking about like, you know, Sandra mentioned about water and the river and how it, it did. And he came and it comes out to like um, Prima uh, Choda at his very end of this, this parable that you set out. It said, nothing ever goes away until it's taught to us what we need to know. So like the river or water, it's the same thing. It never goes away until we learn what we need to know in it. And it's always in front of us and it's always there. And sometimes we don't realize this. And Sandra has sensed it from the water feeling. And this is what he found out. So then at the end, it, it, it assumes that he became the river man because the answer was in the river. Thank you, Sharon. I kind of miss hearing from uh, Jim and Maurice in this session. I'm wondering if one of you would like to have the honor of uh, thanking our guest presenter today. Maurice, I see you diving in. Yes. Um, Renee provided a lot of clarity about just basic ideas, and then we had a great discussion about practical ways of dealing with the river and how you deal with the river and uh, how you view the river. And uh, then others like Kirk Redeen. Uh, gave us a wonderful, very brief discussion of kind of a Buddhist perspective, uh, which uh, Pema Chodron, of course, comes from. So I just think it's been a, a marvelous session of theory and practice together, and uh, with a lot of great experience from a lot of different people. So I would certainly like to express my thanks to Renee for really coming up with a, a wonderful session allowing time for discussion, <laughs> which is always difficult if you're a speaker. <laughs> and, uh, and thank you all for participating. And thank you, David, for being a wonderful facilitator. So it leaves us on a really high note. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Mahalo. Mahalo, Mahalo, Mahalo everyone. Mahalo. Mahalo. <laughs> thank you all so much for being here and joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. Thank you, Renee. Mm